Okay, in this next video we're going to take a look at <coughs> how to plot a graph. This is the first of uh, two videos for this section. There's three parameters I want to sort of cover in this graph. Uh, the first one is quite simply being able to understand how to label both the x and the y-axis. Understand about the scaling, the necessary scaling of the axes, both the y and x-axis. And then finally the third one is just how do you plot points uh, sufficiently on a graph as well. The first criteria we'll look at here is how to label your axes. And first of all, before we get into too much detail, and this should be pretty obvious from your key stage 3 studies and certainly GCSE as well, that the y-axis is the line in the vertical plane and the x-axis is the line in the horizontal plane. And look, this is illustrated in the figure below. And it might be useful just to pause the screen, copy this information out, plus label the axes before we progress. Now, when pupils are labelling both the y and x axes, a lot of students will make a very simple and very common mistake when they decide to put the unit inside a set of brackets. Now, it doesn't matter what exam board you're doing this for, whether it's SEA, <coughs> and I know for marking uh, exams for Excel, that's wrong. You will lose marks for putting the units inside brackets on either axis. So this technique is wrong, and you must not put your units inside brackets. And again, if you want to pause the screen, and just copy down the information as well. Now, <clears throat> there should be a forward slash inserted between the quantity and the respective unit for that quantity. And so this displacement time graph, S for displacement, of course in meters, time t in seconds they should be separated by this slash it's like a forward slash if you like that you may be using the keyboard and that's perfectly correct that's exactly like you should be doing it on both the y-axis and the x-axis and this again will ensure that you pick up four marks in relation to labeling your axes so the diagram above is exactly how the quantity and units of each axis should be labeled and again, if you just want to pause the screen, you can copy down these notes on the diagram as well. And that really ticks off the requirements of the first learning objective. You can now uh, sufficiently label each of the axes on the graph. All right. The second criteria we're going to look at now is a bit trickier, is to, in relation to scaling your axes. <clears throat> and the first thing you need to be aware of for CCEA exams and also at Excel as well, you need to be using at least 50% of both the x-axis and the y-axis. And this is important as well, so that all of your plotting points can be plotted on the actual graph. Now my personal recommendation is to try and come above that minimum threshold and ideally try to use at least two-thirds. You want to make it pretty obvious to the examiner. If you're getting in a situation where an examiner has to lift a ruler or start to count the number of squares you've used compared to the overall quantity, then you're starting to get yourself into potential, potential difficulties. Now look, this concept is illustrated in the figure below. So you can see the overall length of the y-axis is L. And you need to be ensuring you're coming up at least 0.5L or 50% of the overall vertical height. So effectively, this purple line here, your graph needs to be using at least that proportion of the y-axis. And if you recall, ideally, I would personally like to see your plotting points coming up to a minimum of two-thirds of the graph. Again, at GCSE, it's sort of designed that it is pretty straightforward to use probably at least 80%. At A-level, sometimes it does require a little bit of extra work on the student's behalf to get that scaling appropriately. Similarly, your x-axis also needs to be using at least 50% of its axis. So if I come across the total distance L, again, I need to be coming across at least 0.5L. On that green line, again, you need to be making sure you're using at least 50% of that x-axis. And ideally, you'd really want to be using at a minimum for me anyway, if you can try to get at least two thirds. And again, if you just want to pause the screen, you can copy down the notes and carefully copy out the respective diagram as well.
Now the next thing you need to be aware of, and this does trip up quite a few students, surprisingly, both GCSE and even in the A-level as well, is choosing an appropriate scale in terms of number along the x-axis and y-axis. Now you need to be careful first of all not to use a really awkward scale. So for instance, if you were to use a really awkward number such as 3 and 7 for instance, to make up one full square on your graph, you know, you're making your own life incredibly difficult there to figure out exactly where your plotting point is at. You're going to have to go in all crazy fractions and multiply to get the exact x and y positions on your graph. That's going to take you much more time. You're also increasing the likelihood of making a mistake. And after you've done all that extra more difficult work, you spent more time doing that, the worst of it is you are getting zero marks. So the mark schemes are designed that the examiner is not going to have time to sit and use these scales and to figure out exactly where these marking points are. I can tell you from experience, marking the graph questions for a level is quite tricky, it's time consuming and it's difficult to make sure the tolerances are um, okay in terms of keeping on, on track with your supervisor. So the way the system is designed, if you use these awkward scales, you quite simply get zero. They're not marked at all. So please do be careful there. So if you just want to again pause the screen, copy down those respective notes. Now also, you need to make sure, and this does trip up some students as well, that you do choose a consistent interval across each axis. So you maybe have satisfied this one, maybe you've used two, or maybe 10, maybe for instance, uh, you've got 10 wee small squares built in the one big square, and each wee tiny square therefore represents one. It's perfect, it makes it very, very easy. But you need to also make sure that if you're using a certain interval, up as far as the first big square, you need to make sure you keep that same interval throughout. So like here's a, a typical response you might see from some students. Let's say they've got in just five sets of results for extension, that's respective extension, of course, depending on the respective load that they've gathered in. Now their actual raw data has extensions of two, five, nine, sixteen, and uh, twenty-two millimeters respectively. Some students will just literally pit their raw data figures that they're provided in the examination for each square. And that's problematic because the first square here is showcasing an interval of 2 millimeters. The next one's got a difference, you can see, an interval of 3 millimeters. The next one's got an interval, of course, of 4 millimeters. They're not consistent. And as a result, again, you will lose marks in the exam. All right. So if you again just want to pause the screen, copy down those notes on the diagram as well. Now look, again, you can sort of see again, like just this particular error again, demonstrated in graphical form here. So it's useful just again, just to run through more detail. So the first square there has got a difference of two millimeters. The second square you can see when you go from two to five has got a difference of three millimeters. The next one's got a difference of four millimeters going from nine down to five. The next one's got a difference of seven millimeters. The next one's got a difference of six millimeters. Again, they should be the same throughout. This is clearly wrong. And again, the student is gonna lose big marks as a result of that. So again, pause the screen, copy that down please, and just make sure you don't make the same mistake yourself. Now, just going back to that previous example, let's say the raw data gathered by the student was fine and the maximum extension was indeed the 22 millimeters. But the student probably should have designed that graph to look something like this. All right, so intervals of five would have worked out perfectly fine. All right, so five and then 10, then 15, then 20, then 25. But critically, the interval now between each number is consistent and it's equal to five units, and of course five millimeters exactly. Now this is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've got this constant integer now between each respective square of five millimeters, and additionally, because the max extension is 22 millimeters, we have also used at least 50% of the x-axis, the previous requirement that we need as well. So the 22 millimeters is gonna be in around here or thereabouts, you can see you've definitely used over 50% of the, the x-axis 
and you've ticked off both of those criteria. So I just want to pause the screen, copy down those notes and the diagram as well. And that really ticks off you, your requirements in relation to scaling your axes. The third criteria we're going to look at here is just literally plotting your points. And look, there's two ways in which you can plot points in the graph. And these include just using an axe. At the center, of course, of the axe is the actual point on the graph. Or you can also use a dot. And these are seen really in the illustration beneath. Doesn't matter which method you use. I personally would use the axe. I know from experience marking in particular at Excel <clears throat> and some of the other papers there, the majority of students are using the dots. But look, it probably depends on which school you come from and what your teachers have recommended over the years. But just stick to whatever you're used to. But what I would say, look, most students that I've come across in terms of marking just put down the dot. I would recommend to put a wee circle around the dot. And the wee circle just helps to bring the examiner's attention to where that particular point is. Because again, your points may be quite fine. It just helps the examiner to see very clearly where they are on your graph paper. Now look, when you are plotting the axis, that's the game that I use, make sure you use a sharp pencil. If you're using a very blunt uh, pencil, um, look, you could end up losing the mark because it's too thick and there's a bit of a blodge basically at the very center where again, that, that could be taken down in terms of a quality mark there. So just be careful, make sure the pencil is well sharpened. Now again, I've seen the next point in particular becoming problematic. Now when you're plotting the dots, so if you do the dot technique again, again I'd recommend to put a wee circle around that just to help the examiner spot it. Look, to make sure that it's visible, again I talked about the circle around it, but also make sure that the circle's got a diameter of at least one millimeters. All right, just to make sure again it's obvious and it can be seen on your page. Now don't go beyond that. So any bigger than this, and they are considered blobs. Now that's an official term used again <coughs> by the Excel team. <coughs> and those blobs are not uh, counted as sufficient plotting points. They're going over too much of the graph. And as a result, if those circles are too big, they're blobs, <coughs> and you lost half them, all the marks are lost, in relation to your plotting points. So most graphs typically have got two marks for your plotting points, so you don't want to be losing them. So please do be careful. Well sharpened pencil, don't make the diameter too big. But again, you do want to make it big enough that it's obvious and it can be seen by the examiner. So again, you just want to maybe pause the screen, copy down the points on this three diagram as well. Again, <clears throat> we sort of talked about that sort of quality issue there in relation to blobs, but just another thing, look, in terms of tolerances, again, this is both GCSE and A-level, most of them, depending on the actual graph on your page and how big each wee square is, the tolerances, generally speaking, <clears throat> are plus or minus one millimeter in both the X and the Y direction. So again, there is an element of making sure that you diligently plot your points and they are correct. Now again, different exam boards use different techniques for checking them. I'm not going to go into that. <coughs> Certainly for Ed Excel, they check the very bottom and the very top point, and then the points that are furthest away from the line of best fit. But I think as a student, you should take it that every one of your points could potentially be checked. And again, therefore, if you're not inside those tolerances, you're going to lose easy marks. So do be careful there. And again, if you just want to pause the screen, you can just add that extra comment in along the very bottom. And that finishes off the, <coughs> the third learning objective. And that really concludes the first part of this week's section for plotting your graphs. All right. Just want to go back to the very front page here. Just again, I got this off the internet, but I think it maybe drives home the importance of the circles. There's a graph you can see there in the best fit. We'll talk about the next lesson, but you can see the wee circles around the dots. They make it so much easier for the examiner to see exactly where those plotting points are. Or if you've got very fine dots there, it can be a little bit tricky to see, depending on what type of pencil you've used. These things have been scanned in, they're all marked digitally in today's day and age. So, again, the wee circles there you can see are super helpful uh, to the examiner. Definitely give them a go. 
and that finishes up this lesson then.